And without further ado, oh, let me go back. Um, I want to introduce our awesome panelists for World Usability Day 2021. We've got Trina here, um, we've got Morton and Andy, and they are all going to introduce themselves before we get into the topic. So um, I'll just jump right in and um, ask each of the speakers to tell us a little about yourself, including your you know, name, title, your current company. Tell us a little about what you do and how you got interested in, in ethics and UX and, and why it's important to you. And so why don't we go ahead and start with Trina? I figured I was the first one up, <laughs> being the first on the list. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Trina. In Danish, it's Trine. But Trina, uh, Trini, whatever works, it's uh, the pronunciation is uh, can be a little bit tricky. Morten is probably the only one on this on this uh, call who can pronounce it correctly, being Norwegian. Morten and I, fun, fun fact, uh, um, Norwegians and Danes can have a completely normal um, uh, conversation in Danish and Norwegian without uh, any kind of problems. So that's uh, that's actually very interesting from a language perspective. Um, I currently work as head of innovation at Smart Academy, which is a uh, training um, teaching facility in the Denmark, an academy where we train. Um, uh, we do part time training of uh, uh, people primarily in logistics, in um, the different uh, um, uh, marketing fields and stuff like that. And we're connected to a, a full time academy that trains people of uh, that. Um, um, go to school for multimedia, for IT, and for that kind of stuff. Um, I've been working with UX for 20 years. Uh, I graduated as a multimedia designer in 2001. Oh my God, so many years ago. And got my first job at a um, regional newspaper where I was assigned to do usability and information architecture and front-end development, uh, which was uh, interesting back at, back at that time um, but that's really where i started sort of falling in love with usability which was my sort of first step into um into ux we didn't call it ux at the time but you know it, it kind of developed from there <clears throat> and and my um my passion and my interest in in design ethics uh has grown over the years i mean if you're user-centered by heart um I see a lot of people who also are concerned with ethics when with ethics when that's kind of their profile. But I've also worked with design for children for a number of years, and that's where it really um, seriously hit it kicked off because uh, because there's such a, a vulnerable group that we have a huge responsibility as designers and, and UX researchers and, and product people to design stuff that's right for them that doesn't harm them. So that's where my uh, my my uh, interest and passion for for uh, ethics really sort of uh, spiked. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Trina. Um, uh, Morton, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself now? Yes. Hello, everybody. My name is Morton. Uh, I live in Vancouver, Canada, but as Trina alluded to, I am from Norway. So if you want to try to break your face saying my name correctly, it's my name is Morton. Uh, <laughs> which I've discovered P English speaking people can't make the right sounds for this. Um, I work for LinkedIn Learning. I'm an instructor. Uh, I make courses about front end development and basically anything that has to do with the intersection between humans and computers. Um, I also teach at, sometimes at a university locally, the, the uh, Emily Carr University of Art and Design. Uh, I teach interaction design there. Um, and before I became a web developer, I studied philosophy and I spent a lot of time working on ethics. Uh, this was a long time ago. I'm, uh, my students refer to me as an old. <laughs> um, I think one of my students figured out my age at some point and literally stood up in class and said, you're older than my dad, which is uh, always uh, sobering. Um, but when I when I was uh, in university, I wanted to write a master's thesis on the ethical ramifications of human brain or brain computer interfaces. And at the time, the, the, my coaches and everything were like, this is ridiculous. 
like why would you do this this is science fiction and nonsense and now it's happening and you know i, I was i've always been really focused on this the technology is running ahead of us and we're not really treating it in a reasonable way um so i came back to ethics in technology and design about seven years ago because i realized that the conversations that were happening around ethics in tech and design were conversations that acted as if this was something new that, that had just been discovered by the tech industry and that conversations around ethics had never happened before. And I was sitting there going, there's like 3000 years of you know, tradition around this stuff that we may want to refer to instead of trying to invent this from scratch. Um, and for the past, I'd say three years, I've been doing a lot of um, research and comparing other industries to the tech industry to say like, what caused, let's say, psychologists or structural engineers to adopt ethics as their common practice and what changed in their communities that forced them to say, not only are we going to take responsibility, responsibility for what we're doing, but we're going to hold ourselves accountable and make ethical missteps lead to actual professional consequences and is there any way we can do this with our industry which is a very challenging problem so um i come at this from a fairly theoretical angle and more of a like broad spectrum angle um so that's that's why i'm here that's why this is interesting to me awesome thank you so much and last but not least um andy would love to hear a little bit about your background yeah, awesome. So, so I'm Andy. I lead design for Rocket Companies. We are the nation's number one lender. Um, we've got a design team that's focused on all different aspects of lending. And for us, like that's an area that ethics are super important, right? So throughout my career, I've had the opportunity to work in spaces like finance, like healthcare, where the decisions that we make for the products that we provide services to people, they have to really do right by the people who use them. People come to use these products in times that they don't feel so sure about the decisions that they're making. And there's a lot of fear and there's a lot of uncertainty. So being able to really create that sense of confidence in people as they go through this and doing right by them and building trust is front and center of, of everything that we do. And, you know, I mean, the, the story of how I got into this and, and what it looks like is like a lot of people, right? I, I was a designer, I, I graduated, I, I started in the industry and then just saw things collapse around me, right? There's so much shit every day that's like, what the fuck, what were they doing? Like who thought that up? And you know, when, when you realize that you've got the option to either like, I can ignore that or I can really try to solve some of those problems. And, and for me, that was the call to action to lean in and, and find my own way to solve some problems in, in what I touch on a day to day basis. And at the same time, raise awareness for the things that I don't have control over, but can hopefully inspire others to do the same thing. Awesome. So, Andy, that kind of takes me to my first question for the group is, was there ever a moment or kind of like the, the WTF moment you mentioned there of, of some ethical consideration that turned you onto this field or made you kind of look into it or just like a moment that you can remember where you saw something happening and you were like, I want to do this better. Can you think of a, a moment like that? Yeah, I, I assume you wanted me to answer that since you mentioned me first. So it's we're, we're going to have to figure out how to work the panel. But anyway, um, Yes. So for me, the, the, the one moment that stands out in actually doing the work is I was working for in healthcare. I was working at 3M and we were working on software that medical coders use to communicate to doctors, to CDI nurses, to measure quality of care of patients in the hospital. And at the same time, you know, be able to active, accurately bill the patient as they go out the hospital, because as we know, the hospital's job is to make money, not just provide care. So what we found when we were shadowing some, some CVI nurses is that what, when they wanted to communicate, there wasn't a way in the tool that we created for them to easily like share information or ask each other questions. So they were printing out pages, taking screenshots, emailing them, and this had patient health information on it. So it had PHI, so it was unintentional, right? They weren't trying to like cause risk or, or cause harm in any way, 
But ethically for us, like once we realized, hey, we've got to build security to protect people into the software, like that was a decision for me. I was like, wow, everything that we do, even the littlest thing has so much of an impact. Like if any of those printed pages got out or those screenshots, like that could really screw up some people's lives or just affect people in a way that's that's not what we would want to do. So that was the moment where I realized what I was doing had an impact on people. And that to me was the moment of like, how can I do more of this? Uh, Morton, I'd love to know if you have an example of, you know, a real world ethical challenge that kind of changed your perspective. I think the moment I realized I needed to get back into this was when I, it dawned on me that open source developers think that code is value neutral. That when they make things, and this, this goes for everyone, but in particular in the open source community, that you build things and then you're not in any way responsible for how it's used and how open source uh, licenses, in particular the general public license or uh, um, GPL that is regularly used in open source projects, um, actively um, disowns the creator from responsibility of how their tools are used. Because it says once you create something and put it into the world, other people can take it and do whatever they want with it and then redistribute their version of it. And in that, you're then saying the creator has no control over their content and therefore has no effective responsibility, can't be held responsible for what happens once they release it into the world. And the way that that is interpreted by a lot of developers is then I'll just build something and then if people do harmful things with it, that's not my responsibility, which then leads to them saying, I don't need to take care in how I build things because it's not my responsibility what happens to it. And uh, being in a large open source project and talking about this became difficult because the people in the project were so invested in this notion that code and design is by nature value neutral. And the things that happen from my work is not my concern. And there is an entire community built around this ethos, which is a very problematic one that doesn't hinge on reality in any way, but it's become ingrained in the way we think about our design and our work and our development. And that's that's what triggered me to, to say, okay, I need to actually invest time in this again. Whereas I, I, I kind of left it in the past, but I had to go and reread all my materials and everything and try to figure out how to make people understand that when we make design decisions, we're actively making decisions on behalf of other people. And not just that, but we're actively saying, here are capabilities you can use to go into your future. And I am the governor and decider over what capabilities you have and don't have and how you can use those capabilities. And if the people who make those decisions are saying, I'm not responsible for how it's used, then we're in the situation where bad things will happen and no one can be held accountable. And that means no one can fix the bad things and no one actually cares about the bad things. And it's just problematic, so. Yeah, um, I'm kind of curious based on that is, do you have a recommendation for how we might hold folks accountable or how we might solve some of that problem you just mentioned? <laughs> Honestly, we need to get rid of those licenses because they're terrible. Like they're, they're poorly written by, um, let me phrase this very carefully. Uh, uh, white men who are techno-utopians and quite libertarian, um, who really uh, wrote licenses during a time when the internet effectively didn't exist the way it does today, and who wrote licenses on this assumption that the people who are best at something will automatically have the time, the resources, and the capabilities to contribute into a project, and the best people will bubble to the surface no matter what, which is just not how the world works at all. It excludes pretty much everyone who has meaningful input into these projects. Yet that's what we've based the internet on, these licenses, which is not good. And we need to come up with better licenses. Now there is a whole, there's a bunch of projects around this that fall under the umbrella of ethical licensing. Those things don't work because they are too broad and they don't address the core issue, which is the open source ethos in itself has problematic components to it. And we need to rethink how that works before we can even talk about ethics. Uh, so 
there's there's like core work to be done that we're not really willing to do because it means we have to address this reality that we are responsible for what happens when people use our work. And unless our design, the design industry embodies that way of thinking, we can't really move forward. So, so yeah, that's problem. interesting. Um, when I think of ethics and UX, I often think of you know the design and and the product services, but don't often think down to the code level and the licensing level. So that's that's a really interesting point. Uh, and, and Trina, I'd love to hear if you have kind of an example that stuck out to you that got you interested in the field or that, you know, was just a turning point for you. There is, there actually is. It was, um, so as I said, I feel, I've always been invested in usability and in human-centered design and in, using empathy in design but um when my oldest i have two two kids uh two sons they're 10 and 14 and when my um, now 14 year old then i don't know i i it was back in 2015 14 15 um he started playing minecraft um and i i vividly re recall he said mom can you ask can you help me uh, download a mod for my minecraft and I'm, because i'm the tech go to person in the in the household uh so yeah i get all, i also get all the calls from grandparents and stuff it's horrible but you know <laughs> it is what it is um and then you know i tried to to um help him download this mod and after all, this entire experience it was just full of dark patterns full of advertisement full of, um, you know, green buttons designed to look like they, you know, that it was safe to click them. But when you click them, they were actually advertising and just full of stuff that I, as an adult with my full brain capacity, really had to be careful not to make any mistakes. I was thinking this experience that I just went through, this was designed for a seven-year-old, eight-year-old. We have to do better than this. This is not, this is not right. This is just horrible how you know what what are we doing to our future generation and that kind of really sparked my my way into um to ethical design yeah so in that example you mentioned uh some dark patterns and you know clicking something that you think is part of a flow and is not or you know making a big green button when it's actually not the right move for you cool. i'm curious um from you all as experts in the field, what are the new emerging or trendy dark patterns that you're seeing that, that UX professionals should be aware of? Yeah, I was thinking about that question. I don't know if I'm seeing sort of new, new stuff. The things that I'm, that I'm seeing uh, that, that tends to happen uh, more and more frequently though is how we're, we are tied to certain services because um you know the, the there is a dark pattern called roach motel that states that it's really easy to get in but impossible to get out um <clears throat> and the, the big corporations do this all the time um for instance if you want to close your skype account you, you can do that but then you have to kill all your microsoft uh, products now so it's just become horrible and, and that's that trend has grown with all the subscription-based products that we're using They've really grown with with the fact that uh, so so many things have gone cloud based, and I get the business I get the business model behind it because it's actually costly for companies to store uh, all this data in a cloud service. It, uh, it's not costly, but it costs money, right? Uh, it's not uh, it, it's not free, which means that they have to have some kind of of um, recurring income to cover these costs. But it, it's something that I'm, you know, that that's coming up more and more frequently, I think. Yeah, that's yeah. a good example. <laughs> you, know, you know, the one thing that I would say is first, just I would love if, if one person can walk away from today and, and we start to use a, a phrase different than dark patterns, if we can start to call them out for just being harmful patterns or what they are and not make reference to like darkness or light and good and bad in that way. I think that that's something that, you know, would be great to take away, but there are opportunities, right? There, there's a lot of like slimy shit, right? <laughs> Every time you subscribe for something and, and you have to try to unsubscribe, it shouldn't have to be like 
how do I track this down? How do I find this out? Like, why is it so hard to do? How do I contact support and then realize like nobody's here to help me to, to unsubscribe? Like, that's terrible. There are also other things that we do to, to just kind of like increase conversion that are, that are things we shouldn't do. There's, there's ways we use language to trick people, to get them to do something. That if we were just clear in, in our labeling and what we call things, we can prevent that. I mean, you know, looking at like, I, I used this example before. So I, I tried, I ordered deodorant from this company called Native. They're an all natural deodorant. So you would think they're like ethical. They're on the up and up, right? As soon as I did that, I got spammed ridiculously. And when I went to unsubscribe, the first thing that I saw when I clicked unsubscribe was a picture of this dog, their office dog Muppet. And they're, they're showing the dog, his head is down, like his eyes are looking up. And they said, if you unsubscribe, Muppet will be sad. And you think like, where, where did someone come up with this? Why would they want to guilt somebody into doing something or not doing something? And then you look back to years before that, Facebook did the same thing. When you wanted to cancel or close out your Facebook account, they would tell you like, Jill will be super sad if you leave and will no longer see any updates. Or you'll never, you know, hear what's happening from Jerry and his 17 kids that you never met. It's kind of like, what? Like, we often point to a company like that that does things at scale and say, well, if they did that and they've got millions or billions of users, then it seems right for us to do the same thing because that must be working. And when it comes to like ethics, the first thing you have to look to is yourself and your moral compass. And that has to shine through in the decisions that we make. And even with the companies that we work for, we've got to like, the, I, I know Morton talked about this before. We talk a lot about governance, right? The thing is, and I know, I know we're designers and I know when it comes to governance, right? We, we don't always have that final say, but what we can do is get in the practice of when we see something that doesn't feel right, we have to say something. We may not win every discussion, but we will start to change the way the organization looks at things. And that's the, the most important thing we can do. Yeah, have you guys heard about this app called TikTok? <laughs> of course, it's everywhere. <laughs> just, just back to what Andy was saying with the dark patterns. So Ian Bogost uh, suggested a different term for this back in 2011, which is exploitation wear, which I think is very, apropos to this because that's what it is um so i'm on an android phone right it's random tiktok if i click back which is how you normally exit apps on android phones there's a little it just goes to a new video and then there's a little modal that says um if you want to exit there's a tap again to exit up here and notice how quickly that modal goes away See, it just disappears so this app, when you try, you go like, oh, I've spent 17 hours on this app, time to like eat, be a human being, do things. The app goes, actually, here's some drugs for you. Do you want to take the extra drugs and keep going down this rabbit hole or do you want to leave? And then you wait long enough because you're like, oh, new video. And the videos that it shares with you when you're trying to exit get more and more like extreme as you're trying to exit to try to keep you hooked into the application. And if you then keep scrolling, then that experience goes away. Everything about this app is designed to keep you engaged. I, I've been experimenting with it for two to three months just to figure out how it works. It does things like the first few posts you share are very, very popular. They get massive exposure. And then once you start interacting with people, the next couple of posts you post get less exposure. And then this little flag shows up at the top that says, do you want to try, like, here's a, here's a free coupon to try promoting your TikTok, right? Because all of a sudden your engagement is going way down and they go like, hey, well, here, you can try this. And the next time you have to pay for it. But the first time you get to pay for it, if you take that coupon, then you'll get massive engagement on the post that you just promoted because they over promote it, right? And then your engagement goes down again. Like the entire app is designed around just keeping people on the app. Everything about it is about keeping people on that. That is the new UX pattern I'm seeing, that the apps are actively going for 100% engagement all the time and are doing everything in their power to, with like every possible um, implicit bias, every possible psychological trick they in the book to drive people to keep using the app 
under all circumstances to the detriment of everything around it. Like the only thing it cares about is that you stay on the app as much as possible. And I see other tools try to do the same thing because they're seeing how effective it is with this one. And what TikTok has done, which is different from every other social media I've seen so far is they actively and openly exploit all the social, all the um, psychological patterns that everyone else has been kind of cagey about doing. They're like, to hell with it. We read the book. We read like thinking fast and slow. This is a manual of how to manipulate people. We're just going to use all of it right now because then we'll lower the bar on what's acceptable, right? And I mean, you know, if someone from TikTok watches this and wants to be angry at me, that's great. I should totally make a TikTok about this. But that is a perfect example of how you've just thrown out everything and said, you know what? Our job is to keep people on this platform to help with everything else. And unfortunately, it works. And that means other people are going to follow. Wow. Yeah. Um, you know, everybody, I think, mentioned a little bit about as our it's our jobs to kind of watch out for that and, and speak up to that. And Mike Montero says, UX pros should be gatekeepers to um, putting bad designs and services out there in the world. And I want to know from each of you, how can someone in UX design or UX, and re, uh, UX research effectively do that while also balancing the business needs? Because Morton, as you mentioned, like TikTok is basically saying like, yeah, we know what we're doing. Like we're, this is how we're running our business. And as a designer who might work for TikTok, like what do you do in that situation? I think, I think it depends on the company you work for. If you work for TikTok or Facebook, I mean, it's, it's, it's uphill. Um, and, and to be, to be fair, I don't, I actually don't think that ethical design is applicable in, 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 in all products, because if the business model that, it, that is sort of the foundation, so the business model of TikTok is to, uh, to hook people in, keep them as much, keep them there for as long as possible, consume as much in, uh, content as possible. And to, um, to also create as much content as possible, right? That's their business model. How do you, how do you um, make that more ethical? I mean, I wouldn't even try. So, and I think to some people that's, that can seem like giving up, but I think it, you have to look at the business model to figure out whether it's realistic to make um, a true impact. When Facebook talks about ethics council and stuff like that, I'm not buying it. And I know that that Morten, you're, you're, you're smiling. I think you, are, you you might agree with me here. I don't know if you agree with me, but but it's um, I absolutely agree with you. Yeah, I think we should pick our fights. And I, I have full respect that designers and UXers and, and people of our profession, of our industry, cannot necessarily pick and choose their jobs. I have full respect. Of, I mean, uh, those who can are fortunate and have a privilege, right? Um, so, so I think it's a balance. I, I do, I, I agree with what Mike Montero says. I also think it's placing a lot of responsibility and shame on the individual. And I think we have to separate the two. We have to separate the responsibility and the shame that comes with it when the business that we work for um, makes very poor decisions that we have to enforce that we are asked to enforce i think we're at, we need to separate the two because we it's it's not it's not fair of us as an industry to place the blame and the guilt on the individuals so i i like that you mentioned mike mike's actually with our team right now um, but ultimately, uh, having spent a lot of time with him and, and really digging into his perspective around this and, and getting to know, we even talked to him on our podcast about this. It's, it's easy to stand on the sideline and say, hey, we've got to make big change in these companies, right? And, and the truth is that change really happens from the inside. And like Trina said, it's, it's really important to look at the business model, right? That's the key thing that would have to change for companies to, to make more ethical decisions if they're doing unethical things. And when you really look at that and what happens to certain companies, that's, that's also a governance issue, 
that is tied to who is the final decision maker in that company. And when you get to a company like Facebook, it's Zuckerberg. And he grew up privileged, right? Surrounded himself with people who think just like him. So anyone that doesn't think like that isn't going to be in that in his circle, isn't going to be one of those people that, that help him make decisions. And based on that privilege, it's the decision is like, I know what's best for everyone and this is what we're going to do. And we're seeing the, the fallout from that, right? But ultimately the, the goal, and I saw it here too, is like, what, what can we do as designers? And, and the truth is like, we can raise awareness. We can bring it up all the time. I, I know, you know, the, the other thing that people say is like, you know what, you can, you can leave, right? And, and that's not always an option for people. So how, and, and also the people that leave, you don't get the opportunity to drive that change. And, and I get it, like that is hard to shift a whole like way a company thinks that shifts their business model, that shifts the way they work is like, it takes a series of people that can take that as far as they can. And then from frustration, they may move on, but the next person that comes in, comes in with some progress made and then can move that as far as they can. And eventually like things always become illuminated. Like look what's happening to some of these companies now. They're, the government is looking at them, right? So that's when you start, when there's harm, that's when you start to see regulations. And when there's regulations, the response to that is how do we do things in a better way? And you know, that sometimes, and, and if you look at our industry, right, our industry, our, the web in general, right, is, is what, 30 years old, 35 years old? It's relatively new. When you look at other, other industries like auto, right, the first automobile fatality was in the 1860s. And what happened? Nothing, no regulations. You know, seat belts. Seat belts are, you know, you look at the videos from 1980s or when seat belts were actually implemented as a thing that's required. It took how many deaths to get to that point? Now, what we can do is learn from the mistakes of other industries and try to call these things out earlier and figure out what the right thing is to do. But as designers, like we, we literally have to escalate and continue to escalate and point out how not creating trust, not doing things the right way, affect the bottom line of the businesses that we work for. That's the way to speak to them that they understand when you talk dollars to them. Uh, I think th this question is, just, is split in half. So there's the right now question, and then there's the what do we do moving forward question. The right now question is the very difficult one, and that's the one where uh, we constantly grapple with, which is, Person A works for a company that does something problematic. What does person A do? This person probably sits quite low down on the decision hierarchy in the company uh, because you're designers, you're pushing pixels or moving data from one place to another or doing something like that. So the decisions are being made way higher up than you. And you may feel that it's impossible for you to make the change. Like you can say, this is unethical. You can go to your manager and say, this is unethical. The manager can go to the next manager level up and say, this is unethical. But at some point that just dies because the business decision is such that that won't happen. So what do you do in that situation? Both Trina and um, Andy pointed out this major problem, which is that there is a fair amount of shame in these conversations right now um, that it, it, there's this drive towards if some if your company does something unethical then just quit for a lot of people especially people in north america especially people in the united states that is not a viable solution because their job is what gives them health care their job is what gives them housing and food they have families who also need health care right and now especially in a pandemic you can't just walk away from your job. There's no safety net. I mean, in Europe, there kind of is. In Canada, there kind of is. In the United States, there very much is not. And in the United States, that's where a lot of these decisions are being made because in a way, a lot of the employees are held captive by the companies. Um, so when we say, what can you do? Part of the solution is to educate the people on the bottom as to what this is and not just educate, educate them on why is this wrong, but educate them on how do you speak about this in a way that people higher up in the system understand. And that means developing a language around ethics that isn't focused on constant moral judgments or saying this is wrong, but saying here are the reasons why this might not be what we are aiming to do. 
Or here are the reasons why doing this may cause harm in ways we didn't consider. And these are the harms that are caused and there's how that will play out over time. Um, because um, like there, there's a story right now. Yesterday, um, YouTube said that they are gonna take away the dislike count on their videos. So if you go to YouTube, there's like a Nero voting, right? So you can like a video or you can dislike a video. And then under the each of them, there's a number that says how many people have liked and disliked the video. And they're taking away the counting under the dislike. So you can still click on it and the creator can still see how many people dislike the video, but the public can't see it. It's become a private piece of data. Their argument for doing that is it turns out shockingly that the dislike button is being used for abuse which anyone with a brain would tell you immediately, because that's obvious, that's what's gonna happen, right? You give people an ability to tell someone that their work sucks, they're gonna do it, right? So, but it took, what, like five or six years for, for YouTube to realize this obvious thing, and then they realized it's actually so harmful that we have to take it away, right? There was a, a guarantee, there was a designer at the bottom of that food chain that was like, we're adding a count on this, like, have you seen what happens on Reddit when, like, do you, are you aware of the rest of the internet and how the internet actually works, right? So, but that person has no power. So giving that person the capability of talking about this in a constructive way would help. Uh, for the future part of that conversation, like what do we, how do we move forward? There's this idea that we are working in a profession. That's not true. We as web people don't have a professional practice. We are practitioners because we've never established what it means to be a web professional. A web professional, for there to be a web professional, you have to have a training school, you have to have certifications, you have to have oversight, you have to have a code of ethics, you have to have licensing and everything else. And usually professions do this on their own. So for example, engineers. If you go back a hundred years, engineers would build bridges that fell down, right? And then people died. And then over time, they realized, oh, the work we do actually impacts the lives of human beings. So maybe we should stop doing bad work, or maybe we should hold the people who do the work badly accountable for their bad work. So they went and created a code of ethics for themselves. And then they went to governments and said, I want you to enforce it because we can enforce it, but only to a certain extent. So I actually want government to enforce it, right? So if you build a bridge now and you're an engineer and the bridge falls down, it's a, it's an, it's a crime that is prosecuted by the government, right? More, more importantly, if you're an engineer and you observe another engineer doing something that falls outside of the ethical guidelines and you don't report it, even if it had nothing to do with the decision being done, you lose your license to practice because you're showing bad ethics by not actively saying something about it. For us to continue doing the work we're doing now in the way we're doing now, we have to start thinking about it in that way. That means unionizing, that means um, uh, creating actual definitions for what we do, creating requirements for work, actually professionalizing our industry, which the entire industry is against because the entire premise of our industry is anyone can do this and there are no limits, right? So embracing our responsibility as future builders and taking that responsibility seriously and realizing that the work we do impacts human beings is the way forward. And that actually starts at the very bottom with every new entry into the industry immediately being onboarded into this. You have a responsibility to raise this stuff. This is the language you use to do it. This is how you raise it. And these are the, these are the things you can do if something goes wrong. Like, how do you report this? Who do you report it to? What do you say? How do you talk to the media about unethical practices? All this stuff. Yeah, so Morton, you talk a lot about government regulation, and um, I think a few of you have talked about modeling after other industries that have gone through this. Um, uh, Trina and Andy, I'd love to know where you'd like to see government regulation go, if at all, um, and what, what you're hoping from that. Uh, Trina, let's start with you. Well, I think um, couple of things. I, I, I just want to respond to a couple of, of the, the very interesting uh, comments in the, in, the, um, sure. in the comment trail. And also just some of the things that, that both uh, Morten and Andy have, have talked about. The, the, you know, whether we speak up or don't speak up. There is, there is like, um, you know, pros and cons to doing that. You may have to leave your job because you disagree so, so fiercely with your management. Or um, 
you fear you you fear that you will get blamed for uh, for decisions the only thing we don't want is to create to to make any kind of impact because i do agree we have to speak up we have to speak up in ways i agree very much with that in ways that that uh, the business understands and most importantly the only thing we don't want is to create trench wars is that the right uh, is that the accurate uh, terminology we don't want to stand on each side and just throw mud at each other from you know business and, and designers um mm. we we have to to get to a common ground and the common ground for management very often is an excel spreadsheet so we as designers are not good enough to speak excel um there are tons of ways to measure on ethics in design and we we have to learn how to do that because that will get the attention of management and we also have to stop thinking about exponential growth as the only uh, success criteria we can actually start challenging some of the current decisions being made by saying okay can we do this differently and still maintain the same revenue it's not about growing it's about retaining the same revenue if if we have to talk about those types of uh, uh, argument, right? But when you, coming back to uh, legislation in Europe, we have GDPR. Um, we already have a pretty extensive legislation there. Actually, just today we had uh, we had a visit at the academy from our data protection officer. We have a data protection offer, officer who works with us and comes by every you know now and then to just you know. Um, make an analysis and let us know where we have to sort of tweak stuff to uh, to stay complicit to to, uh, to GDPR. Um, I think GDPR has made a huge positive impact. We are seeing huge fines and um, you know stuff like that in Europe. Uh, I think it's also become quite problematic for uh, American companies who make do business in Europe because they actually have to comply as well. Um, I'm very much for this type of legislation. I'm not sure whether the, uh, the industry is uh, receptive to legislation related to ethics. I'm, I'm, I'm just not convinced because there's no tradition. Uh, however, I think that we're also missing some important um, uh, ISO standards, for instance, the ISO 26000, for instance, is actually one that could be used as a foundation for ethical design. It's, it talks about, um, it, it relates to sustainability. So I think that we have, we actually have some, ISO is not a, it's not le legislative, right? But we actually have some, some pretty um, conform standards in place already that I think we, we could look at. As, as modern, you said, uh, the industry talks about this as if it's something invented by tech, and we actually have a pretty, pretty extensive history of working with standards as well, not just with ethics, but standards and standards relating to all sorts of things. Why not start there? Yeah. And uh, Trina and, and Morton, I think actually all of you, including Andy, had mentioned something about giving designers the language to talk and influence and helping folks kind of speak the language of Excel and the language of business. Um, I'd love to know what, what tips or advice you give to designers or researchers or just UX professionals on the call now of how to get that influence um, and, and use your voice to speak up against unethical uh, decision-making. So I think when it comes to, to language, the most important thing is to do what you would normally do, like do the research on the company, understand how people communicate, understand what people like, if we go and talk to our partners with design speak, they're going to kind of like, not listen all the time, they're going to, they're going to perk up when they hear words that they understand, but they're not going to relate. And I know there is a time and place for us to, to speak, you know, about nerd out on design details. But at the end of the day, like, we've got to understand the language that that our partners use. And if we can add new vocabulary to that language, that's great. But if we're talking two different languages, we're talking past each other. So the most important thing is to find that common ground in the way we communicate, find the things that are super important. And then when we do say something, we're speaking a language that they understand. And when we're talking about, you know, ethical concerns or, you know, anything that impacts people, 
positively or negatively, we want to be able to communicate that and we want to communicate it as quickly as possible. So understanding those words that that resonate with them and ways to communicate in what's important to them. So understand the key metrics and drivers of, of the business and understand the impact of doing right or wrong on those numbers. And you know, as, as researchers, it's really important to be able to, to tie every decision we make to those metrics and even beyond that. So where we work, we have these, uh, these beliefs, these values called isms, and they're the fiber of our company. And if we can tie our product decisions, our design decisions to those, then the whole company understands and gets behind them. Some of them are like easy enough, like do the right thing, right? So if we see something that's wrong, we can literally say like, that's not doing the right thing. And people will listen. People are like, wait, what do you mean? What are we doing that's not right? Because we wanna always do the right thing. So understand the values of your company and be able to tie decisions in their language to them. That's great advice. Uh, there's, okay. there's, um, there's this thing in modern philosophy that's called capability approach which applies in a very significant sense here. Um, it's a branch off duty ethics, if you ever want to like, dive into it. Um, it was originally developed as an economic theory um, by a guy named Amartya Sen from India to figure out how to distribute help to people in countries that, or regions that needed help. And what he came up with was this notion that um, help is only valuable to people if it gives them the capabilities to do and be what they have reason to value in their context. Meaning you can give everyone a bike, but not everyone needs a bike. And not everyone can use a bike and understanding each individual and how their needs can be met and how, and then give them the capabilities to do things and the agency to decide how to use those capabilities are essential to making good decisions in general. That way of thinking, applies directly to design work. Because if you actually think about any design, what you're trying to do is give a person a capability of some kind. It could be to consume information, right? It could be as simple as understand the contents of an article. It could be watch a video. It could be understand the contents of the video. It could be access the contents of the video without listening, right? Subtitles. It could be adding a product to a shopping cart or buying a product or being informed about what product they buy or finding an actual credible review of a product they want to buy, right? Every design decision in some way modifies the capabilities of the end user. If you frame the conversation around any design decision in terms of the capability, you can bring it all the way to the top of the food chain and say to the manager, what are the capabilities we're trying to give the end user here? And are those capabilities things that will help the end user do and be what they have reason to value in their context? Or are we making decisions about what the user can do and giving them capabilities that may harm them, right? Um, and that changes the conversation dramatically from, you know, we, we need to do this for ROI and then someone saying it's unethical to what are we actually trying to do here? Is the end goal to get people to buy the product okay, who should buy the product? Who, does, who is this product actually helpful for? And why is it helpful to them? And this opens the door to have a much deeper conversation about the business. Why are we doing this? And what parts of our business are actually meaningful? Because long-term, and Tidia and I will tell you about this. She wrote a book about this stuff, by the way. You should totally go and check it out. It's a very, very, very solid book. And she has a workshop happening sometime in the next year, apparently. Uh, so all of that, that, this notion that when we do work, we impact people's lives. And when we do that, the business benefits because when people's lives are impacted in a positive way, they will come back and tell you, this was amazing. I'll give you a practical example. I have door handles on my door, shockingly, and they've one of the door handles broke. And I was about to go to Home Depot and buy a new door handle for $300. And then on the website, on the Home Depot website, at the very bottom, of the page about the door handle, I noticed that it said lifetime warranty. And I'm like, oh, wait a second. Can I call them and just get a new door handle? So I called Wiser Lock, the people who made the door handle. And I said, hey, do you have a lifetime warranty? Yeah, we do. Okay, can you just send me new door handles then? Yes, we can. That information was buried so deep in the system that it was almost impossible to find it. 
and the only reason I found it was because I'm the guy who scrolls all the way to the bottom of the page to see if there's any like information there, right? A designer who has the best interest of the user in mind would have put that information at the top because that's a selling point for that feature, right? To say, you buy this lock once, falls apart, get a new one, right? That's a huge incentive. I will keep buying locks from this company because they are fixing the problem that they created. But that requires this other way of thinking, right? And that very much roots down to this idea of the capabilities we are giving people in doing our design work. Yeah, I love the theme of, you know, if you can convince your company that doing the right thing for people will ultimately create more customers, loyal customers come back over time in the long run, it's, it's better for the company. Um, I would like to ask, and I know there's been some comments in the chatter for those that do have the luxury, as it's been mentioned, to choose a company and select a company, what are some things that UX professionals should ask or look for when they're looking at a prospective company? So I, I go to the business model first, try to figure out, okay, how, how is this actually run? And also in this uh, startup day and age, I look at the capital. I look at, at what capital has been put into the company. Um, how is it backed? Is it, you know, do they have an exit strategy? What does that look like? Um, because when a company is a startup, not a stay up, regardless of their scale, if they have an exit strategy, that can have a huge impact on the way that the business is run. Because typically um, companies that have, you know, an exit strategy and are uh, at the same time are founded on a business model that relies on uh, building a huge pool of uh, users. It's, it's typically a really bad combination because you typically know what happens to that data once the exit is, is real, right? Um, so I definitely would go and look for stuff like that. Um, and um, also the mission statement. Go to the mission statement. You know, is it, is it just fluffy words or are they actually solving problems? Do, does your values resonate with the mission statement? Awesome. Andy, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I actually think Trina got it like spot on. So the mission statement is the place to, is one of the best places to start. Read that, look at the values, and then look at the product and see if they're actually living those. Because a lot of times they may just be words on a website and you can find out, do, do a little research, do some digging. There's a lot of like websites that you can go to, or there's an app called Blind that you can actually see like anonymous um, people that have worked for the company before talk about their experience there. So just understanding like what happens behind the scenes, because a lot of times where there's smoke, there's fire, right? So reach out to your network, look at who maybe has, like what that reputation of that company is both externally and for the folks that work internally, because that's gonna really be the tell more so than the language that they use on their website. And Morton, what are your thoughts on that? I should unmute myself. Values are important, uh, trust, is important. Um, more and more big companies now have trust teams. Um, talking, like finding out what their trust teams are doing and what how they define trust is very important, especially if it's a company that does any kind of consumer focused product, especially if it's any kind of online service type product. Um, not to, you know, not to sing this, sing the praises of my own company, but if you go look at LinkedIn's trust page, it is extensive. And the amount of work that uh, LinkedIn is doing internally on trust now and has done over the past several years is extensive. Um, the, seeing that when companies start embracing this idea that we are impacting people's lives and really taking that to heart, things change. You also see it in Microsoft. When Microsoft introduced this idea of um, uh, inclusive design, many years ago now, where they said, instead of having personas, we're gonna have persona spectrums, where we look at a persona in different contexts where they may or may not have all capabilities available to them. Like the classic example is a person with full use of both arms or a person 
holding a coffee cup or a phone or something, so only have use of one arm, or a person with a, a broken arm, or a person with no arm, and say a persona should cover all of those different use cases for each persona, the spectrum of use cases, because they all happen to all of us all the time. Just something as small as that has a significant impact on the entire way the company thinks. Um, the, if I were to go work for a company, I think the very first question I would ask them is, how are you dealing with accessibility and equity? Not equity in how much money are the stockholders earning, but equity in how are we ensuring that everyone has access to the service regardless of their circumstance. Um, because on the internet, there's too much content that is still being produced that is not accessible and that is simply unacceptable. Any company that doesn't put accessibility first in their process is, a not, is doing something wrong, literally doing something wrong. And any company that doesn't address historic injustices, um, who doesn't address um, the historic, like who doesn't provide support for his, historically excluded populations, who doesn't put equity first, is a company that isn't doing the work necessary to move society forward. And I say all this as someone who is extremely privileged, who can go into the workforce looking the way I do with my background and get a job. A lot of people can't do that due to historic exclusion, due to us, all these other factors. And for them, listening to me say, oh, you should just discard all jobs because they're not you know, doing things right, is not constructive. So I'll say this instead get the job where you can do the most meaningful work for yourself, right? And figure out how do you prioritize this? What are the three things that matter to you? You have basically have, you get a job for money, you get it for culture, or you get it for meaning or value, right? And you have to figure out like, how do you define those things and what are you gonna do with it? Um, you need to have, find a job where you can do, you can achieve your goal with the job. If the job is solely to make money, that's fine. If you need the money, if you need the healthcare or whatever, then take the job, even if it's a job that doesn't do all good things. If you're looking for a job mainly to find the people that are like you, then hire yourself for a culture. If you're looking for a job that gives you meaning in some way or where you can impact other people's lives, then find a job that gives you that value or that has that value. But be very aware that the burden of fixing the world is not solely on your shoulders. And you can take a job where everything that's being done isn't 100% ethical because if you come into that job knowing that and you know where your own line is and you know the line you won't cross, then you're able to do good works. And the reality is for all these big companies that are doing bad things, we need to go into those companies and push them in the right direction. If all the good people leave the companies, they will just do more bad things. Yeah. And so um, we are just about out of time for our panel portion. So I'd love to end with this last final question for everybody um, is if you were to give advice to a new UX researcher or designer, what would that one piece of advice or best practice or just tidbit be for them to, to help them design or research a little bit more ethically? And, and Morton, I'll, I'll start with you. Do you have half an hour? <laughs> I'm sorry? Do you have half an hour? No. <laughs> I said one. Advice. What's the what's the no. what's the best piece or the, the biggest piece, the, the most important one? Remember that you are building future, building the future for other people. Everything you do builds the future for other people. That's the job you're doing. Awesome. And and Trina, I'll move to you. How do you follow up on that? Um, challenge the norm. Challenge the norm. Love yeah, it. don't don't accept it an argument just because it's we we usually do this. <clears throat> Ask yourself and others whose truth is that. Love that. Love that. All right, Andy. Last but not least, what is your piece of advice for new UXers out there? It's to be curious, stay curious and, and dig into the whys until you really understand the, the true, like why things are happening that will uncover a lot. That's great. Awesome. Well, um, big thank you to all of our panelists, Morton, Trina and Andy, you were fabulous. Um, I, I've seen that there's a bunch of resources 
put into the chat, including uh, Trina's book and amongst others. So um, really appreciate all of your knowledge today. Um, we are going to do um, some breakout rooms here in a bit, but before we do that, uh, we also will be sharing a recording of this talk along with the, the transcript um, and the chat. So don't worry about scribbling down notes. I know I saw a couple of you doing that. We will be sharing that out. Um, and let me go ahead and share my screen. Yep, so once again, big thank you to everybody. Um, I, we are going to start our networking breakout room. So um, if you do not wanna join and no judgment, if not, um, please go ahead and, and drop so we don't put you in a room and, and uh, nobody's there for the other folks. And so we'll give everybody a couple minutes, but it is an awesome place to meet UX professionals. I have gotten every job I've ever had through networking. So it's super important. And in, in this day and age in COVID, uh, we need all those opportunities uh, that we can. Um, but a couple ground, uh, ground rules before we get into it. Um, please do treat everyone with respect. Give everybody a chance to speak, be kind and empathetic and assume positive intent. Um, please do not uh, share any negative or offensive comments in the chat rooms. Um, we do have a code of conduct here at UX Research and Strategy, so please make sure to follow that. All right, so for those of you who have not been uh, to UX Research and Strategy um, meetups before, at the end of our networking, we usually just do a small group discussion with everybody, just any thoughts, reactions, any interesting things from your groups, any questions that you want to ask. Um, so if you'd like to, to share something, use the reaction in Zoom to raise your hand, uh, and I'll ask folks to come off mute and, and, and share their ideas or thoughts. Anything interesting from your, from your breakout groups that you discussed? Let's see. All right, Katie. Um, <clears throat> hello, everyone. I'm Katie. One of the things that we were talking about um, right at the very, very end, and it kind of referenced the panelists before was, um, if you're trying to talk to like your managers or the business or all this stuff, it's like, you need to have that vocabulary. And so I was asking in my breakout room, like, you know, kind of going, starting out in the UX field, like what are some good skills to just have? And um, everybody was agreeing like business development and having that lingo and stuff and like, look at who's cutting your checks and just being able to talk to those people um, is a really good skill. And it like is gonna play out pretty much in every part of your life. So thanks. Awesome. Yeah, did anyone else have anything interesting come up in, in their group? Anyone have any questions? I know it looks like we still have uh, Trina on. Morton is here somewhere as well. And Morton, okay, I, I was think. Like, just looking around. I was like, I know he was here earlier. I'm not sure if he was still here. I hear his Norwegian laugh. <laughs> All right, just, Josephine. Um, yeah, I really loved being in, in the group sessions. Uh, was my, I think, maybe my first or second meeting with this organization. Um, we did hear from Morton talking about how in Norway because um, apparently there are, are people who are going to visit some um, like, I guess like a national park, like the American, the uh, Norwegian equivalent of an American national park to, and they want to have pictures taken of themselves, you know, at a certain, with a maybe a certain mountain in the background or something. And apparently because, uh, so many people are doing this just so they can take a selfie of having been there. The government is, is talking about the possibility of uh, restricting access to these sites or maybe uh, eliminating access to some of them altogether. And I think that's, um, you know, that's a, a problem because of you know, people's uh, intentions are no longer just to go and be in nature or experience nature, but now their their drive, their intention is to, I want to be taken and have a picture taken of me in this, uh, you know, this famous place. So 
um, you know, that that's an example, I guess, of how, um, you know, because of the impact of social media, um, you know, we have to make some evaluation and make some choices about the impact that our work is having on other people and the environment. Yeah, um, just like um, I think it was Morton who was talking about always thinking about the future and how it impacts people. And I think all the panelists have mentioned that. Um, Monica, did you have a, a comment or a question? Yeah, sure. I just was going to say our breakout room had four people. Um, two of us are entering the profession uh, now through boot camps, and two of the people were exper are experienced professionals in the field. And it was really great just to have that dynamic uh, conversation. Awesome. Thanks, Monica. Glad to Can I ask you a here. question? Do yeah. they talk about this stuff at your boot camp? I have not. Uh, there might have been like one tiny module of it, but no, not to the extent that I would hope so far. And I wonder, well, I would be curious to hear if you have ideas for how I can encourage the boot camp. There have been a few things. There have been a few uh, things in the curriculum that I'm like, that is discriminatory in several ways. Or <laughs> um, So I'd be curious how, how that might be worthwhile to bring up to the curriculum designers. Morton, I, I kind of gather by your comment that you're interested in in that topic. And did you have any advice for Monica there? Well, it, it's kind of hard to it's kind of hard for a student to be like, "Can you change your curriculum so that we?" <laughs> but uh, it's working for, from the inside, yeah, you know. For, like <laughs> for you as a student, the simplest thing you can do is to start it yourself. Like have a cohort within the group that says, "Hey, let's discuss this." you know, at night or do something else and pick some books or some materials. Um, I provided a link earlier to the, the best resource that uh, I've found is from the Marcula Center of Applied Ethics in Santa Clara. Um, they have a massive amount of resources on how to learn ethics and technology practice, including like literal PowerPoint decks you can download and presentations that are pre-configured so that you can do a presentation. They have discussion sheets and challenges and like examples all this kind of stuff you can use also i don't know where she is in your view but today in this book is a good reference for this um there's also another book that's called the practicing uh b -b 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 uh hold on one second the it's called the conscious creative by Ke by kelly small which is a collection of very short almost essays on how to do different things and why all these things matter, matter that are, that's really good as a reference. Um, so I'll, I'll share a huge pile of links in the chat and then you can all try to find it. <laughs> awesome, thanks, Morton. All right, Christian, I think I see you next on my hand raised screen. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah so I appreciated the talk and um, I was specifically looking for things I can actually start doing right uh beyond the theory and so yeah that that list uh that morton was just mentioning and then i'm also very curious about the city program that was linked in the chat um i think that those are going to be pretty good leads to either get me started maybe implement some of these things within my team so i uh, very much appreciate that that content Awesome. Thanks, Christian. Great. Uh, I'm so sorry if I mispronounce your name. Uh, Tiziana? Tiziana? Sorry. I'm muting myself. Yeah, it's close enough. Uh, it's actually Tiziana, but um, as I say, it's kind of hard to read from my spelling. So, um, yeah, I want to mention a couple of things that I found um, that I really enjoy about the talk. I being um, I am a freelancer as well as a teacher, and I always include ethics in my talk. So um, in my classes all the time, because we talk about psychology and we're talking about persuasion. So of course, I always talk about ethics before even mentioning how you can persuade people. Um, but there is another aspect I noticed that not a lot of people talk about it, which is 
the positive, using media and social media and all that kind of stuff for positive use. Because there is a lot of talk about how not to do bad stuff, um, how not to use harmful patterns, how not to do things. Uh, but there's not as much talk about, well, these tools are here to stay. We can't eliminate them. Can we just use them for good? And a lot of people are doing. Um, so I'm finishing my master in media psychology and I'm focusing on my last project exactly on that. And there is a lot of resources as far as uh, positive media psychology that really focus on leveraging all this media uh, for positive change, both for behavioral change towards wellness, as well as providing support or things like that. So I was wonder what you guys think about that. Yeah, does anyone have any thoughts on almost, it sounds like you're talking about using the persuasion and, and mm -hmm. behavioral techniques for Good. positive change versus- Correct, like a, correct. Yeah. Like something like, for example, the, I don't know if everybody knows, but the app Noom, they're trying to make you, um, you know, have a healthier lifestyle by using psychology. And they openly say that. So they're using some kind of persuasive techniques and uh, to help you review, like kind of uh, reassess your, the relationship with food. So they are taking advantage of psychology for good. So I'm kind of curious, you know, I don't know if anybody has any thoughts on that. Anybody have thoughts? I think in general, everything we know about behavioral psychology can, and I, 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 I I agree very much with you, Tiziana, that we can use this for good as well. But any, anything we know from behavioral psychology, we can choose to use that for good or for, for evil, right? Um, and fortunately, there are a lot of digital, uh, digital services out there that actually use these, um, this knowledge for good. Um, where we have to be mindful is, and this is, I mean... This is this might be more of a philosophical uh, discussion, Q. Morton, <laughs> um, but it's the it's a notion of just because we think that something is for better, does that mean that it is actually for the better, or is that just my truth? Is and and you know that's amplified if I build up, decide to build a product that sort of amplifies my truth on a certain thing. Is does that make it a good thing? Or is, is, that, is that always a good thing for the people that end up using this product? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that makes, makes great sense. And the idea would be, well, I give you the tool, but at the end is your choice if you want to make that change or not. Exactly. So yeah. that's, that's why I was mentioning Noom because nobody forced you to use it or nobody forced you to do it. But if you do, I will give you the support mm. by yeah. using psychology. So obviously still based on finding out what the customer really want or what the user really wants. So it's mm. not what I want, it's about what they want. I just provide the tools so yeah. they can be more successful. Yeah. So first of all, um, David Dylan Thomas wrote a book about uh, cognitive bias and how it's, mm -hmm. how it's used in yes. design and can be used. That's called right. Design for Cognitive Bias. I put it in the mm -hmm. comments. I just bombed the comments with a ton of links. <laughs> I don't know how constructive that is. So I'm going to send the whole pile of links to the organizers and then they awesome. can somehow disseminate this in a more... Thank you. <laughs> um, but uh, there's a very difficult thing with this whole notion of I can manipulate people into doing good things. And that is the manipulation part because that's what all of this is. And it, like uh, Trina alluded to, it's very difficult for us to know whether... Like to know what is the right thing to do for other people, right? Especially when we're trying to guide them. And um, there, are, there are ways of using cognitive biases in a positive way, but it's only really something we can do with oversight. And by oversight, I mean the kind of oversight you see when you're doing psychological research, mm -hmm. that in advance you have to go and actually apply. There's a board that looks at what you're doing. There are checks and balances in place so that you can the project can be stopped at any time. Um, a lot of the work that's being done by social media companies is types of work that would never be allowed in an academic setting right. because it is manipulating people and messing with their biases and trying to figure out how they work. Like you're going and messing with the brains of other human beings just to right. see if you can earn more money, right? Right, right. And anytime there's any drive towards 
exploiting your cognitive bias in anyone, regardless of what your intentions. That is the warning bell that says, stop, 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 stop. Step 15 meters back and look at this and say, what are you trying to do here? And is there some way you can do it without? Because any, any use of a cognitive bias is effectively manipulation and you are taking agency away from people. Like that, that um, new map has been heavily criticized for being manipulative because it's guiding people towards one very specific way of dealing with uh, health and wellness and weight loss that isn't necessarily the best way of doing it, and especially is not the right way to do it for a lot of people. Um, and once you're into it, it has all these um, social enforcement systems that makes it into a game, which, like I said, Ian Bogost correctly defines as exploitationware, because once you gamify something, you're making life decisions of a person into something that they get points for. Right, so it's a it's a extremely challenging problem to address, and it is a it it is very much something where you almost have to go read um, a book like Thinking Fast and Slow, mm -hmm. and then make each of the chapters because each of the chapters addresses one cognitive bias, and then say, okay, each of these things is now a warning sign for all my work. So anytime I touch on any of these things, I need to stop and think: is this actually? done correctly? Is it done in a way so that the user understands that we are exploiting their cognitive bias here, right? And is it done in such a way that the user has agency to choose if they want to be part of this or not, and they can choose to exit, right? The big problem with things like Tech Talk is once you're addicted to it, it's very hard to leave. And when you leave, it feels painful because it's an addiction, right? So getting like social media addiction is a huge problem because these companies have basically figured out how to create an addiction. And that's why in some countries, they're, this is now starting to be classified as an actual disease, mm -hmm. right? And it's because we're using cognitive biases against people. Yeah, that's interesting, Morton. Even though something like Noom or, or other wellness apps seem positive because it's wellness, it's still using manipulative techniques that that takes away that agency, like you mentioned, very interesting. Thank you for sharing. All right, I thought I saw another couple of hands up, but maybe they're back down. Any other questions or thoughts or insights? Um, does anybody else in the group have other resources they wanna share with others? Anything that have helped you in, in this area of, of trust and ethics? All right, Katie, I see your hand up. Is that from before or is that a new hand? No, this is this is a new. Um, awesome, perfect. Does anyone have any podcasts kind of related to this stuff? Because I'm a big audiobook podcast listener. Um, so, yeah. Anyone have good podcasts or audiobooks to share? So some of the actually, links I shared uh, have good, are good audiobooks, and some of it is easier to consume as an audiobook because it's very heavy stuff. This would make a great subject for a podcast. Somebody should think about starting one. Uh, there is a new book I just read that's very interesting that doesn't sound like it's about this, but it's actually about this. Hold on a second. Um, it is called... I just have to find it because it has a terrible title. An absolute, no, uh, A Beautifully Foolish Endeavor um, by Hank Green, you know, the YouTube guy. Uh, so he wrote two books, one that's called An Absolutely Remarkable Thing and one that's called A Beautifully Foolish Endeavor. And I, I think I can like nominate these as worst book titles ever because they in no way tell you anything about what these books are. So the the overall story, you have to read both of them. The overall story is what happens if a company figures out how to tap into our brains and then basically do VR, but in our brains. So it's like uh, Ready Player One without all the 80s nostalgia and nonsense and white supremacy and just very, very in-depth, a guy who's really thought carefully about how, how dangerous is it to have technology plugged into our brains. And they're quite good. They're good books, but the, I'm not judging the book by their title. I'm saying when you see the books, you would have no idea that the subject matter is some is what it is. So uh, those are, and the audiobooks are great because they're like performance audiobooks, so they're very engaging. 
Awesome. Any other folks have um, have good recommendations? And uh, Morton, would you mind adding those to the chat too, so folks can have them, especially with the long and really interesting titles that you mentioned? <laughs> Uh, I have one. The, the Amidiar Network made a um, ethical design kit, um, and it's kind of, it's an ethical explorer pack, is what it's called. Mm -hmm. So it gives ways to assess the organization's, you know, potential things that could go wrong, and then it goes, gives tools to talk with teams, your teams, about the issues and even paths to address those issues. So there's some really good practical application there. I'll yeah, put it you in. can download it and print it out for free. I put the link. Yeah, in. it's beautiful too. Awesome. It's really Abby. well designed. There's also the Humane Interface by Jeff Raskin. That's an old one. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. Awesome. Well, that that takes us to about time. I just want to thank Morton and Trina for staying on um, a little longer to chat with our folks. Um, I really appreciate everybody staying for the networking portion and, and asking your questions to, to the group. And please do join us at our at our next event. Um, we're going to be doing more networking and happy hour chat uh, on December 1st. Um, also, please do fill out the, the follow up survey. We want to make sure that our events are awesome for, for our community. So please give us that feedback. And as always, connect with us on all of our social media. Um, we're happy to hear from you in our Slack channel. Uh, and with that, happy World Usability Day. Thank you again to our great speakers and have a great rest of your day uh, or night, wherever you are. I appreciate it, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me. It yeah. was a pleasure. Thank you, everyone. It's been fun. Bye, y'all. Bye. Thanks, y'all. Bye.